Welcome. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the attendees who just joined uh, the webinar. Uh, I'm Giovanni Zanalda, the director of the Duke Center for International Global Studies. And uh, I'm extremely uh, honored and delighted to have a second event uh, on global supply chains. Uh, we had one last week, and uh, this week is going to be a different perspective on uh, uh, global supply chains, in particular on food supply chains. Um, I would like to introduce the speakers, but before I do that, I want just to uh, say that this particular event, uh, like the one from uh, last week, is organized uh, within the framework of the Rethinking Diplomacy uh, program, that uh, is a, a program run through the Duke Center for Leadership and Global Studies with the support of the Trent Foundation. And uh, of course, uh, because as, as I mentioned last week, global supply chains are part of uh, a very important um, uh, world of negotiations and uh, they, uh, of course, imply uh, many uh, different partners, countries, uh, of course, logistics, uh, or for us interested in diplomacy in the large uh, uh, sense of the, of the world, uh, this is a, an important time to reflect on uh, trade, global supply chain, and all type of connections that can be established across the world. Um, today, uh, the title of today's uh, webinar is The Mechanics of the Food Supply During COVID-19, Mother Nature and Selective Resilience. Um, we are uh, lucky to have two uh, distinguished speakers who know um, a lot about uh, global supply chains, in particular food supply chains. Let me introduce them. Uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Wiltz is the principal data scientist at Lineage Logistics. He heads all efforts related to labor automation and inventory management within Lineage 293 cold storage facility, including predictive machine learning for labor optimization, queuing theory for scheduling labor, and computer vision for product identification. Dr. Witt and his algorithms are the air traffic controllers of inventory and lab labor across the food supply chain. Uh, Daniel uh, holds a BS uh, uh, Bachelor of Science in, Ph in Physics from the University of California, Berkeley, and uh, a PhD in Applied Physics from Harvard. And um, for, I would say that uh, even though what I, uh, uh, his bio seems very theoretical, you will see from the presentation that um, this is extremely applied. And the fact that we are lucky today to have food in a supermarket uh, despite COVID-19 is also thanks to the work of uh, Dr. Witt and Elio Wolf and all the people working in the, in the, in the, in the field of logistics. Uh, the second speaker is Elliot Wolf. Uh, is Vice President and Chief Data Scientist of Lineage Logistics, uh, which is the largest temperature control warehouse owner and operator in the world. Approximately 80 billion pounds of food annually transit Lineage 293 facilities, which are concentrated in the US, continental Europe, the UK, and Ocea uh, Oceania. The Lineage Data Science team is responsible for the mathematics, statistics, computer science, physics, and research and development, underlying storage, shipment, and routing of food, as well as the seating, design, and operation of the warehouses. His work, it's, it's work primar primarily implicates convex and combinatorial optimization, numerical simulation, agent-based modeling, clustering algorithms, uh, time series analysis, various machine learning algorithms, and high-dimensional data visualization. Fast company named Lineage Logistics number one in data science and number 23 overall in its 2019 rankings of most innovative companies. Elliot is an alumnus, so he has a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from Duke University, so thank you very much for uh, being back, at least virtually. <laughs> and a Master in Science in Statistics from Stanford University and JD from Stanford Law School. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time. I know it's always a busy time for you, but right now it's even busier. <laughs> and uh, before we start, I want just to, uh, the rules of the game is that um, Elliot and Daniel are going to do a presentation. 
And uh, 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 if you have questions, I mean, if the attendees have questions during the uh, presentation, they are uh, more, uh, they are welcome to ask those questions. They will uh, have to use the chat room and I will ask the questions on your behalf. In addition, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Laurie Lickman and Professor Gary Giraffi. They are both at Duke University. I'm sure uh, most of you are, uh, know them very well. And, uh, and they will be discussants and uh, not only because they are interested in, uh, in the topic, but also because they know the, uh, the two speakers. So Elliot and Daniel, thank you very much. And uh, now uh, the floor is all yours. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So I'm sharing the screen, putting in full screen. Okay, wonderful. So first, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's a crazy, crazy supply chain out there, probably the craziest since the Second World War. But uh, we do all of this for uh, the benefit of food consumers like yourself. We find it tremendously interesting to work in this industry uh, at this point in history. And lastly, we feel that uh, a better understanding of how all of this works would make people a little bit less, less antsy. Um, some ground rules for this is that um, Daniel and I are expressing opinions and interpretations that are own that are our own. They're not uh, necessarily those of lineage logistics proper. Um, in addition to that, in order to pull you the absolutely latest data that we could, um, most of this was pulled together in the last 36 to 48 hours, and so we didn't have time to to uh, make all of the chart formats the same. Uh, there's some stuff we'll, we'll hypothesize about, but uh, we want to make clear that we're super excited to write academic papers after all this is done. Um, I would caveat that all of this right now is our, our preliminary interpretation based on our knowledge of the industry, steps that we've taken, and uh, things we know are going on in the supply chain. So with that, um, we've got really four, four things to cover here. Uh, first is a supply chain primer. It's really hard to talk about this because most we refer to as civilians uh, have never seen the supply chain. So uh, we'll give you a little primer on how it works. Uh, then we'll go into factors that give the food system an underlying uh, resilient quality to it. Um, third, we'll go into changes that we've seen since uh, COVID hit. And then lastly, observations on adjacent supply chains that we don't operate, but that we know at least minimally about. So let's start with the supply chain primer. Um, first, if you attended Professor Leachman's Econ 101 class where I spoke in early March, uh, this will be review for you. So apologies in advance. Um, but this is our business, the giant frozen warehouse. Uh, the basic, basically what they are, take Home Depot, triple its floor area, double its height, heavily insulate it, install a couple megawatts of industrial refrigeration, fill it with food, uh, and uh, yeah, it's frozen. So inside the buildings, just warehouses. And temperature for us, the most predominant temperature zone is zero Fahrenheit. So it's cold. And this is where the food lives. Now, Lineage is the largest owner operator in the world. We have 293 facilities uh, and that number keeps growing and growing and growing, but particularly we are the largest in the United States. Um, we operate, we touch approximately 40% of the refrigerated and frozen cargo moved in the US. And so you've definitely eaten something out of our warehouses. The closest warehouses to Duke are in Statesville, North Carolina and Tar Heel, North Carolina, okay. You haven't heard of us, but you've definitely heard of our customers. So this is 10 tons of Sabra hummus sitting on a dock in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, those of you in the South, you know and love Chick-fil-A. Uh, we do all the blast freezing and outbound handling for Chick-fil-A. Uh, and you can't forget the 55 gallon drum of honey barbecue sauce. Um, by most recent estimates, we touched about 60% of US meat exports. This is a beef uh, this is a beef box at the Port of Oakland with the USDA export uh, certificate. Most of our volume is via truck. Um, we don't know who's, who drew the Kim Kardashian truck, but it happened. Um, there's a lot of food movements that happen inland via rail. These are refrigerated box cars at the Union Pacific switchyard at the Port of Oakland. And then uh, lastly, we uh, do a lot of unloading and loading of container ships, uh, for specifically the containers. This is a view from our facility at the Port of Norfolk, Virginia. So we're gonna trace 
consumer goods through a normally functioning supply chain, just to give you some idea of how this is designed to work. So we harvest strawberries in Southern California, or at least the, the customer harvests strawberries in Southern California. Um, in anticipation of turning them into jam, they are mixed with sugar and put into these very large 400-pound uh, drums. Those 400-pound drums, we then place into industrial blast freezers. Um, those blast freezers turn the material from liquid to solid, uh, and then it's stored. So the first move of that material uh, in becoming jam is that it's gonna get harvested in Oxnard, California, which is northwest of Los Angeles. Then it's gonna get shipped via a UP frozen box car to Orville, Ohio, where a factory turns it into jam, in this case, jam used in peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, those finished peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are then sent to uh, one of four warehouses, all of which Lineage operates. For the Northeast, Allentown, Pennsylvania. For the Southeast, McDonough, Georgia, near Atlanta. Uh, for uh, the Middle U.S., it's going to go to Chicago. Uh, and then for the Western U.S., it goes to Southern California and the Inland Empire. Then from those four warehouses, uh, the food travels to local distribution centers of retailers. So um, Harris Teeter is the predominant grocery store operating in North Carolina. It is a subsidiary of Kroger. Kroger runs a single warehouse um, in central North Carolina that feeds all of the, the Harris Teeters in the area. And so we're shipping to that and then Kroger is handling the last mile distribution to the individual retailer. So that's your nominal journey through the supply chain. Now, if you're to look at this system and other aspects of the system and ask, okay, why is it resilient? And to be clear here, we're talking the scope of the resilience that we're discussing is for perishable agricultural commodities, the things that you might think are most sensitive, things that require temperature control that could rot very quickly or easily. Okay. So first, let's take a look at harvest. This is the USDA's data on where strawberries are harvested in the US. And there's a couple observations here. So first there are multiple, there's a relatively small number of major strawberry growing areas, but they're in different reason, regions. Um, that's both to affect a hedge between Florida and California, between Southern California and Northern California, and between uh, the Cal California and, uh, and the Pacific Northwest but uh, it's also to allow for seasonality. Each of these growing regions is in season at different points in time and they overlap and any one of these could fail due to weather or some other shock. And so uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of slack built into this system. That hedge extends right across the Mexican border. So when you work in food logistics, you get to do things like stay in lakefront properties in Mexico, uh, all while running thermal experiments at uh, warehouses near Guadalajara. And so strawberry supply chain uh, season start in January uh, in Jalisco, and then they roll up the west coast of North America, hitting Florida uh, so that you have strawberries year round. Now it's a similar phenomenon um, for other crops. This is apples. You've got multiple growing regions all over the place. Winter wheat. You might have an idea of the Midwest as the wheat, wheat, wheat center of production, but there's also a lot of production in, uh, in Washington and Montana and in the Carolinas. And so what I want you to take away from this is that there's a lot of different sources here and those different sources cause redundancy. The same is not true for ventilators, for instance. Second is inventory management. So, okay, imagine I'm making this move. Um, for this particular manufacturer, all of the jam is, is going to be manufactured kind of as they need it year round, but all of the strawberries and, and Oxnard are harvested in the April through July timeframe. And so what you've got is the, in order to match that consumption pattern with that, uh, that mother nature driven agricultural cycle, uh, you're storing inventory. So from April through July, we're just building this massive ramp of frozen strawberries in a building that can hold about 90,000 tons. And then in the off season, which corresponds mostly to the school year, we are then depleting those supplies. And so you take all of these crops from all of these places with all of this seasonality, and then adding all of this inventory to match it, you've got very, very, very large reserves in the system. Now, even when there's no underlying seasonality of consumption, 
uh, there is very often culturally driven seasonality, or sorry, when there's no underlying seasonality of production, there's still culturally driven seasonality of consumption. So take pig parts, for example. Um, in certain times of the year, people want to eat baby back ribs. That's centered around the 4th of July. In other times of the year, people want to eat hams, Christmas, Easter. Um, those, you can't, it's a subtle point, but it's an important point. You cannot just kill the ribs off of the pig. So you either have to throw away the stuff you don't want to consume during that season, or uh, instead what we do is we put it in cold storage for potentially for months. Um, and you kill the pig for its ribs on 4th of July, and then its hams hang around until Christmas, and then you've now utilized every part of the pig. Elliot? Or, yep. Yeah. Uh, so this makes me want to sort of bring up two issues uh, that are sort of more generic to the global supply chain. One of the big issues that a lot of people are raising is the lack of resiliency, as they call it, in the supply chain, mm -hmm. and uh, particularly as it relates to manufacturing. Right. And the fact that there are only, you know, single source um, uh, providers, yep. basically, and this is yep. one of that's coming out of the whole global shutdown with COVID-19. Uh, so, you know, this, my first observation is, my goodness, we've known about the need for resiliency in the food supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, why didn't, why was nobody taking the lesson anywhere else? I imagine that's not something right. you can really, uh, really right. right. answer. But the other issue, the way that you guys build up inventory and then draw it down over time is another element of resiliency in the supply chain. Right. And globally, what's happened is that most firms have gone to just-in-time manufacturing. Correct. And, and as a result of that, Correct. they don't keep the same type of inventory. Correct. And, right. and uh, so what you see here is there's actually nothing really new under the sun. We knew all the lessons. We yeah. just applied them in right. other things. Yeah. Yeah. So we, in our observations on adjacent supply chains, we, uh, we have some, some judgments on how others manage <laughs> this. Okay. Um, but I think the, the lesson here, and it's a really great segue um, because what I showed you was inventory management at steady state. Well, that doesn't include all of us getting kicked in the teeth on a regular basis. And we get kicked in the teeth in ways that are actually quite similar to COVID, but ways that other industries have not historically had to deal with on a regular basis. So let me go into some of those. Um, another, hey, Elliot, another, yeah. another point is that th there's a resiliency built into the food supply chain that, that we're kind of forced to do by virtue of bacteria on its own, right? Bacteria wants to eat our food and it spoils. Mm -hmm. And so we're a little bit, things are a bit more efficient, so to speak, right? Because yeah. we, we really have only a few days to get it to the grocery store and then they have a right. few days to sell it. Whereas masks say, you know, the, the part that expires on the mask, right, is the elastic band after eight mm -hmm. years or something, right? So yeah. we're kind of forced to be this good by, by all the stuff that Elliot's about to talk about. Absolutely. And so here's some examples of some emergencies. And these are the kinds of things that the food, the food industry experiences on a regular basis that until now, 3M never did. So um, mother nature is not at steady state. All right. So it'll be apparent why I did this odd visualization in a second, but just roll with it for the time being. So when I started at Lineage in 2013, the, if you just looked at shrimp imports into the U.S., the number one was Thailand. Uh, and consumers maybe perhaps know Thai shrimp. But um, Thailand was number one. India was number two. The rest of the world was number three. Um, Indonesia was number four. Vietnam was number five. China was number six. And then Ecuador was number seven. Okay, so that was the shrimp world uh, from the perspective of the United States in 2013. 2014, it largely stayed similar, except you had a growth in uh, shrimp farming in Ecuador. Okay, whatever. Um, but now in 2014, Thailand starts to have problems. And all the while, India starts to pick up the slack. And all the Ecuadorians are also increasing their production. Okay, stable again. Sta Stable-ish again. Keep going. Thailand continues having problems. And now 
India is the number one shrimp, consistently the number one shrimp exporter to the United States. And uh, not apparent here in the rankings is the fact that India now, India now exports about four times the amount of shrimp to the U.S. that Thailand does. So you get a 4x swing. This is a huge reordering of international trade. Now, almost certainly consumers did not notice this. Shrimp supplies were not disrupted because of all of these inventory dynamics and also because of very efficient commodity markets. But from the perspective of the food system, the food system had to massively rejigger itself in order to affect this new world order. Well, what happened? Why did Thailand fall off a cliff? Um, turns out it was a virus that has little spikes protruding from its surface. Uh, sound familiar? Um, that virus in this case was called the yellow head virus that uh, makes the shrimp basically starve to death. But um, the point is you have these massive biological phenomenon that suddenly disrupt the mother nature given uh, uh, seafood supply that we're depending on. And so uh, global pandemic, we have had active discussions around global pandemics for years, and they frankly had nothing to do with human pandemics, but they had everything to do with animal pandemics. Uh, whenever you come back to the airport, that little cute beagle is inspecting your stuff primarily to keep certain, uh, certain swine flus out of the U.S. pork supply. And it's the same thing with seafood. Now let's talk about this guy. So this is the California market squid. It is the primary source of calamare sold in North America in Italian restaurants. If you ping the NOAA, the NESDIS satellite that looks at the sea surface temperature all around the world, you start to see crazy things, particularly off the west coast of North America. So for years, we've been struggling with what's turned into an almost permanent state of a weak El Nino and often state of a strong El Nino. And it just lights up the Eastern Pacific Ocean off the coast of California. So now let's look at what that did to shrimp. 2013, the year that I started, um, fishermen harvested approximately 118,000 short tons of squid off, off the coast of mostly Monterey and the Channel Islands in Southern California. Okay, and that was exactly their quota for cow fish and game. 2019, they suffered a more than 90% loss in the this, in this squid fishery. And what did come through, instead of the traditional peak in the late summer, what did come through is now coming through in December and January, creating seasonality problems uh, and conflicts with strawberries. So this is, again, a complete reordering of the supply chain, a catastrophic lack of availability in a particular seafood item. And I would, I would pay money to anyone on this call who hasn't been able to order calamare at an Italian restaurant and knew that it was because of, either noticed that they couldn't get calamare or knew that it was because of this. The stuff has been available primarily because of efficiency, uh, efficiencies in commodity markets and the hedge is built into the system. Okay. Now, the last thing is that Donald Trump is not in steady state either. So um, what do we do with that? The tariffs and all of the trade wars and associated tit for tat over the past several years almost served as a dress rehearsal for COVID. So um, retaliatory tariffs went into effect in September 2019, and suddenly you had an approximately 80% decline in the, uh, in the uh, imports of, uh, of seafood from, from China. And yet consumers didn't notice these things. And it's because it's the job of the commodity traders and because it's the job of the infrastructure owner operators in order to backfill this capacity and hold enough inventory for a disruption like that. So um, as far as the underlying resilience of the food system is concerned, I'd leave you with three thoughts. So first, there's lots and lots and lots of sources. Um, we have very efficient commodity markets that allow you to backfill from all over the world if you have a problem. And then lastly, uh, we have lots and lots of inventory actual in physical storage in the United States. And so that's why you have been able to get cauliflower and fish, but uh, perhaps not toilet paper. So now let's dive into COVID. Wentz, let me turn it over to you. Yeah, sure. Um, 
maybe a final point on on the stuff you were just saying is there's mother nature provides a lot of random independent events that are one-offs almost so to speak and and covid for us um has almost kind of just been another one of these um here Elliot, can you go uh, next slide yeah. so everyone remembers the kind of when we first got the stay at home order um everyone decides to go to the grocery store and stock up right so toilet paper meat vegetables everything non-perishables perishables just get everything put it in your fridge and hunker down right so these are outbound, these are outbounds from our facilities and you can just see this massive, massive spike in demand, right? This is a facility um, closer to the East Coast, Northeast. Yeah. Um, and compare that to a facility in California, which is kind of almost shrugged its shoulders and said, all right, yeah, I mean, I guess a little bit. Um, maybe yeah. this is some part due to Instacart having a larger presence or there being more Costco's in Southern California, or just some version of collective chillness of not needing to panic buy from California, who knows, but this, this distribution center, I mean, you see a slight uptick um, and then a small downtick, of course, which this kind of makes some sense, right? If everyone's panic buying extra food, um, they're not necessarily consuming more food, right? We're not all 10 or 15 or 20 pounds heavier than we were in March, just by virtue of panic buying. So you should see the associated, the associated dip, right? Like their food consumption is relatively flat, but there's, there's quote unquote fake demand. Yeah. Ellie, can you go next slide? Yeah. Me? Sorry, my computer. Yeah. So th th this is an interesting plot here. So again, outbound movements, and you can see the uptick in, in March from COVID, but you can also see the huge uptick in November for Thanksgiving and then the associated drop. And then another big uptick for Christmas and the associated drop. And if you kind of draw a horizontal line from the peak in March all the way over, you see that this demand spike at our biggest facilities was just kind of a small Thanksgiving in terms of how much product we need to ship out. So. Uh, this kind of the 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 quote unquote panic buying was almost less than a Thanksgiving, so to speak, which which I find kind of interesting because it's been in the news everywhere, right? Uh, stores are out of toilet paper. There's people hoarding stuff left and right, and and it's just it's kind of fascinating. This is a this is an interesting thing. So when people are people are panic buying or, or going to the grocery stores to stock up. Um, it might not always be the same item or skew mix as they're used to. So what we looked at here is what products are coming into our facilities from production. Yeah. So it's kind of important to remember there's vaguely four steps in the food supply chain. There's production, then the product comes to us, lineage facilities, and then there's some grocery store uh, distribution center, think of a Costco's Costco, um, and then, and then the grocery store. Um, and so these are coming to us straight from, straight from the producers. And you've probably seen in the news that the, the meat packing industry is getting hit pretty hard by COVID, right? Uh, people are working close together at those facilities. Um, and, and that obviously increases the transmission rate. And, and we've seen that We've seen that a ton in our data, right? There's, there's far fewer meat products coming into the facilities. And an interesting point is that the, the, volume is relatively, the volume is relatively the same, right? So the skew mix is changing, right? But the meat is down. So it's kind of this, it kind of harkens back to this, the calories consumed are relatively constant. Maybe the skew mix will change, you know, if the meat producers, are say putting less in the stores, marginally less in the stores, then people are buying more bread, more flour, more vegetables, more mm -hmm. fruit. And then, and then that makes its way back up to the supply chain. And they're like, oh, well, we need to send more, more fruit and vegetables to grocery store number five. Okay. Yeah, Lauren. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, what we're reading in the popular press is that a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables, think strawberries, lettuce, those sorts of things, farmers are not even bothering to harvest. 
because they say they can't cover the cost of the labor to ship it and to pack it. Okay, mm -hmm. now I assumed that that was a function of the fact that in facilities like yours, you were not moving stuff out because clearly you can freeze strawberries and right. inventory them. Okay, right. not the same for lettuce. Yeah. But you're not showing anything like that occurring here. So what is the problem? So so let me try this, Daniel. Um, so first, this is going to be a very subtle point, but the breed of strawberry, the genetic breed of strawberry for fresh consumption is actually different than the one for frozen and processing. Oh. Okay. And so a lot of these things aren't totally substitutable where you can just completely freeze them. The other thing is that, yes, there are lots of farmers, and we'll get into why, who have had to plow into the fields for one reason or another, but there's also lots of farmers who've been, who have the supply chain and the connections and the storage capacity reserved with us to send us more than normal. And so Daniel and I were talking about Jamba Juice today. Jamba Juice, yeah. There, no one's no one's drinking Jamba Juice, but the the IQF, the frozen strawberry producers for Jamba Juice, are trying to stockpile every cubic foot of space that they can, so that they don't have to throw it away, because of the like the seasonality of the growing period, right? Like yeah. this is this is the hot period. They're only right. going to get strawberries during now, so right. And there's also there's also El Nino in here too, which was that a lot of this a lot of the growing seasons for fruit got disrupted last year because of the the weather in this in the western US. And so the comparison is not totally on, it's not yeah. only covid. It's yeah. March April 19 versus March April 20. Right. Sorry, two questions from the audience. Uh, one from Victoria who asked about the uh, volatility in one of your charts. She mm -hmm. wants to know whether they represent day and night cycles. Okay. So uh, these yeah, yeah. these primarily represent day of week. So the gray represents, gray is 24 hour rolling and red is seven day rolling. And so you've got, you've got cyclical day of week, hour of day. Um, and so the that's dips what are the, the dips are the weekends in the gray. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And, but it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting point though, because if you look at, um, if you look at the volume spike in April and also the volume spike during, um, during the holidays, a lot of that, a lot of that increase is taken up by capacity on the weekends. And so as an operational matter, the way that the, the way that you mechanically ship all of this extra stuff out of these facilities is by utilizing unutilized capacity, which has historically been on the weekends. Okay. Yeah. Then the so. second question is about, uh, how about difference in supply chains that serve restaurants versus grocery? Seems yep. like uh, there has been a big dislocation yeah. in restaurant demand. Is that inventory on hold or is getting redirected to supermarkets? So perfect timing. Let us um, yeah. Let us keep going, and we'll answer that. We'll address that within thirty seconds. Two, or, two or three slides. Yeah, yeah. Great question. Yeah, I think, I think maybe to to Lori's earlier point of it's really hard to disaggregate um, random events that are happening, random spikes, random spike events that are happening to us. Right, COVID is happening at the same time that we're coming off or in the middle of an El Nino. Right, and that's why that. The, the demand, the inbound quantity of nuts is so low is because the, the harvest, uh, we've basically been in an El Nino since late 2018. So 2019 growing season kind of makes it through. And then that, that weather from the Pacific makes it all the way it's over, makes its way all the way over to the Southeast where all the peanut farmers are. And then they get hit hard and, and all of a sudden there's a 20% relative decrease in nuts coming to our facilities. So it, it's hard to it's hard to disaggregate this stuff, so we just have to kind of tell a story and do the do the best we can. Yeah, this is the outbound product mix changes. So subtle difference: there's inbound is coming straight from production, and outbound is what's being ordered by the grocery stores. So you know there's some food conservation law here of eventually those efficient supply chain hypotheses. You know eventually those should become the same over time, um, but but at least temporally, they don't always overlap. And the story is kind of the same. Yeah, the meat packers are, are relatively struggling and, and fruits and vegetables are, are just kind of, they're coming in, they're going out relatively unfazed, which honestly I would find 
I found surprising at the beginning of, of the, the panic buying COVID period. You'd expect the fruits and vegetables to be the things that ran out at the store, but that supply chain is just kind of functioning, right? Um, what's out is baking powder and, and flour and pasta and rice and beans. Um, I mean, it makes some sense, right? They're non-perishable, but I just found that surprising. So next slide. There we go. This, this plot here is kind of near and dear to, to Elliot and I. This is something that we specifically worked on at, a, at some of our facilities where there's a huge demand shock in late March and grocery stores are emptying out and everyone wants to, to buy everything on the shelf. And there's, there's labor issues as well, right? Of what, it, what if we get some COVID cases at some of our facilities? You know, what should we do? Do we have an obligation to deliver food to the public at the safety of employees, right? It's not, it's not a trivial question, it's hard, right? So the solution we kind of came to and is we talked to our customers and talked to our customers' customers. So the producers and the grocery stores, and we adopt this policy of calories out. So what they want to try and do is order half of a pallet of food to the grocery store because they don't need a full pallet of food. And we've kind of told them no. You know, you need to round up, right? Get calories out the door, push, push food all the way down the supply chain. And you can see in this plot here, the average cases per order, you know, hovered around whatever, 48 or 50, and then it jumped all the way up close to 60. Um, and this is, and this is people rounding up and saying, just give us products, send us whatever you've got, uh, which I think is a resilient and, and inspiring and fantastic, right? This is just people... This is a supply chain that has four or five different companies in it, but they're finding efficiency, just getting people on the phone and, and rounding up orders. It was, it was kind of a crazy week, but it was, it was fun. Yeah, that was a crazy week. Yeah. I mean, you have to get like four stakeholders on the phone and it's just, it was, it was kind of crazy. This, this, this plot here is the performance of an algorithm that we have that predicts how long pallets will stay in the warehouse. So, is a machine learning algorithm. You give it, you tell it about a pallet of food and it'll tell you how long it's gonna stay in the warehouse. 10 days, 90 days, eight days, et cetera, et cetera. And this is showing the mean error in days that we saw in this algorithm. So updated the algorithm towards the beginning of the year, reaches some steady state where it's stable. And then the COVID-19 thing has happened as, as we get into April and the algorithm is, the air is just skyrocketed because this is such an unforeseen event of what's going on. It, this is behaving nothing like the previous three or four or five Aprils that we've had. And so the air is just greater. So these are just, we, we use this algorithm to know where to put product in the warehouse. So the better that this algorithm does, the more efficient our labor is. So these kind of supply chain shocks that we feel, you know, on the demand side at the grocery store have implications for the efficiency of our labor in the warehouse. And so you can see how these, these shocks kind of introduce inefficiencies throughout the supply chain. Yep. And as a reflection of that, um, <laughs> some stores have started to see Thanksgiving turkeys uh, out for consumer distribution because like, there are certain localized poultry shortages and everyone's at home. So if you've got a big family to feed, a Thanksgiving turkey is really not a bad thing to do it with. And on top of that, um, these were in inventory with that build started after Thanksgiving 2019 in anticipation of Thanksgiving 2020. So the stuff was available. Why not? And so here it is. But that was not in the historical record. And so that's one of the things running right. through yeah. our algorithms yeah. haywire. This, thi this thing is expecting the, the turkeys to stay till November. And now right. all of a sudden they're getting shipped out, right? Right, right, right. So I believe it was Victoria who asked about the restaurant supply chains. So yeah. um, Wince, you wanna, you wanna take this yeah. or should I? All yeah, right. I will, we'll do it together. Yeah, so this so this, is, on, the, on the left is a 10 pound bag of flour and on the right is a 50 pound bag of flour, right? And there's, as Elliot explains it, you know, there's huge economies of scale for flour, right? The, on the right is what you could expect to give to a baker or a restaurant that say bakes its own bread. 
And on the left is something that you'd buy for yourself and it would last a long time. And there's, I would say the restaurant industry probably goes through way, way, way more flour uh, than, than for personal consumption. And how can you get your 50 pound bag into your 10 pound bag, right? Because the restaurants are all relatively closed down. So what are you, are you going to scoop it? Like what, you, what what's going to happen? So it's, it's almost like the supply is there, but it's not the supply that people want, right? It's kind of an interesting concept. Of like it has to be, are you going to buy a 50 pound bag of flour? I mean, maybe, right? And, and this says nothing of the vast majority of flour in the United States is transported by railroad train car, which is an unfathomable volume, right? So how can you get it into, you know, those, those bite-sized packages, right? You know, mm -hmm. This this is this is kind of the plot that shows the the fall off of the service and restaurant industry, right? They the the cases that they order are bigger. They order they buy in more bulk, just full stop, right? And what and what we're seeing is a huge trend away from that. If the if the if the if the pounds per case is dropping off, it's just a clear indication that that things are moving more towards the home consumption side, smaller packaging, smaller bite size more each picking, that kind of thing, rather than getting a 50 pound bag of flour, right? Right. But what has been happening in, in fields is, is tragic. Perfectly good produce is getting plowed back into the fields. But for the food industry, it's not unprecedented. Whether it was taken out by a lack of restaurant demand or taken out via some bad weather event, it, the food industry is still resilient against stuff getting taken out. This just has a much more emotional element because it seems perfectly good. Now, the specific technical aspects of the challenges here um, partly relate to packaging in that very often leafy greens and or uh, berries or other fruits, they're going to be packaged in the field. And so if you, uh, you, you're, you as a farmer receive the packaging from your end customer uh, before you even pick the stuff, and if you haven't got the right packaging on hand to sell it in the right channel, you have a problem. Now, you separately have a problem in as much as uh, the buyer for your produce may no longer be liquid. And so you have to rejigger all of these things and effectively retool your factory. Now, you can't do that in the time scale necessary to harvest fruit without it rotting. But often you have Five, four or five week harvest cycles where you harvest one and then you harvest another and another round, another round, another round. So basically this next harvest cycle after they got through this pain is now going in through other channels. We've also seen much more creative use of packaging. So um, this is a, this is a bunch, but this is a 30 egg carton. Uh, this is what you would see right next to the cook at Waffle House. This is a food service package. But these things are starting to get redirected to the right distribution channels and then actually ending up um, in, the, uh, in the grocery stores as you can buy 30 eggs. And consumers at this point are very happy to buy 30 eggs. And then the other thing was clamshell production. Um, if you're selling fruit or vegetables into the restaurant industry, you're not putting it in the clamshell like you would at the grocery store. That's a waste given the size of the package that you need and the cost of the packaging. But um, now that you want to sell it to retail, you need to take this physically out into the field uh, before you pick. And so as those are becoming more and more available, um, the situation is getting better. But it's not perfect. It's sad. But the, the way we look at it is as if El Nino rains wiped out a slug of the Southern California fruit harvest. And sad, but it's not unprecedented. Jason, supply chains. Okay, Professor Leachman, we're going to get to <laughs> your first question here. All right. <laughs> Ever, everyone's favorite topic, toilet paper. Okay, so toilet paper has become, in the mind of the American consumer, the emblem of the supply chain failures during this time. I can probably say that Lineage Logistics handles zero toilet paper and zero feedstocks with toilet paper. Um, we don't have direct data on it, but uh, we've all been to the grocery store and it, it's, it's a fair uh, scapegoat for all of this. But toilet paper is really emblematic of 
where the supply chain is weak. So first, to Professor Leachman's point, toilet paper is absolutely positively the most just-in-time produced good you could possibly imagine. Um, demand for it is constant. Um, and um, you don't want to store very much of it because it's very big physically uh, relative to its value. And so they were producing exactly as much toilet paper as they needed and no more. Now you could say, hey, there's been no increase in visits to the bathroom through COVID. Yes, that is true, but there has been a channel shift just like the food service versus the, um, versus the retail whereby more trips to the bathroom are now occurring at home compared to the Duke University campus or Daniel in my office in San Francisco. And if you look at those roles, they're really produced with a different commercial objective. They're being purchased by someone who's not actually using them all the time. So they're not as soft, it's different feedstock mix, different percentage of recycled paper. They're also larger to minimize the labor necessary to replace them. And they're also going through separate distribution channels because they're ending up at completely different uh, destinations that totally bypass retail. And so the relevant market for toilet paper is not toilet paper in aggregate, it's toilet paper for the retail market. And that's really what's fallen off. And so stuff like this is getting redirected. Uh, a lot of it's actually going through e-commerce. Uh, where Georgia Pacific is now like injecting it into the supply chain that way. But um, it's, uh, it's emblematic of the just-in-time struggles. And uh, it's hard. This, this is the, one of the first slides I showed you all on what an actual uh, retail distribution supply chain looks like. This all had to be set up. You have to arrange the carriers. You have to have the warehousing space. Uh, you, you need all of these contracts in place in order to affect this distribution. And, th and this particular one has been refined over decades. And so to just say all of a sudden, Georgia Pacific, the main producer of office toilet paper has to completely retool its factory and completely upend its distribution channels. That's a really tall order um, in the span of weeks. Now the unfortunate part of this is they and us in the food industry would have benefited from some warning on all of this. I mean, I stood in front of Professor Leachman's class in early March and only talked about COVID impacts on the international supply chain. I myself did not anticipate it would have this big of, a, of an impact on the domestic supply chain. But to the extent the federal government knew about it in January and February, that information would have been helpful to start setting all of this up in anticipation of that. But instead it just hit the entire supply chain and the folks who had a lot of inventory could weather it and the folks that didn't were kind of screwed. Professor. Uh, so this um, makes me think about uh, the fact that when you talk about a lot of it is packaging issue and essentially having to reorganize your production facility to change the nature of the packing. Mm -hmm. And when you think about that as uh, an option to the firm, it's really not an option to the firm mm -hmm. because, uh, unless you perceive this to be the permanent new future. Right, great point. Because there are huge costs associated with that. Yeah. And, uh, and how do you flip back and forth? Right. Okay, right. and so, you know, I don't see the solution uh, in the short term, really being mm -hmm. some major changes in uh, production and packaging. Right. Am right. I right about that? I think I think you are for toilet paper. If I'm Georgia Pacific, I don't make a long term bet on the on the that toilet paper demand will stay as high as it is. Um, in the okay, case well, of let me ask you about flour, okay? Because this mm -hmm. speaks to what we think the yeah. future might look like, and right. the viability of the restaurant industry. Right. Well, so 50 pound bags of flour are interesting because they are theoretically possible to handle. But now you have a problem with the retail store shelf, where if you go look at the Harris Teeter shelf for flour, it's not really set up for a 50 pound bag, but Costco is. And so those big box retailers have been able to take that and just run with it. And so I think it's more a question of whether, whether, I mean, a possible bridge to this gap is if the retailers actually rejigger their shelves in order to 
absorb these large packages. And I frankly think that they would benefit from that because um, it's just much less drama. It's much less checkout time. If you really want 50 pounds of flour, it's more efficient to do it all in one go than, than five times 10. Um, so, but the other thing though about retooling is um, the farms, farms like toilet paper, yes, flour, yes. You're talking about a mechanized production line where you need to rejigger all this stuff. For, for, for berries, all you're talking about in difference is just changing the package that you bring out into the field. And so because there's still a lot of manual labor attached to that, the retooling is not a literal retooling. You still have the distribution channel problems, but you don't have the, how do I rejigger this factory to use a different size bag? All right, cool. The question, um, Daniel and Elliot, a couple of yeah. questions. Could, could you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So one is from Connell. I've read that meat exports to China fell off dramatically because of the pandemic. Is mm -hmm. any of this being redirected to the US market? So this is a little bit complicated. So meat itself is not, um, there's multiple, there's multiple types. There's pork, there's poultry. Uh, the funniest part of this whole thing, and I, um, I shared this with Lori's class, was that uh, Chinese state-owned en entities seem to be sending smoke signals to the Port of Oakland to continue the pork exports. And the inland supply disruptions in China were not, not total. It was only 10% could get through. And the things that they prioritized were actually pork. Now, beef was a little bit of a different story, but you see the kind of policy, policy objectives of the, the Chinese government playing out there. Um, as far as uh, beef and poultry, yes, there, are, there have been excesses, but um, frankly, from our perspective, US export volumes have picked up again. So we have not seen a wholesale redirection of it to the consumer market. Um, I think it's a possibility, enough of it exists, but you have basically the identical problem as the, um, as the, as the restaurant versus retail distinction. Um, and it's actually bigger because a, uh, an export package of meat could be upwards of uh, 30 or 40 kilograms. And so like getting that to a safe way is hard. Um, I think the main places where we've been actively involved in discussing where it should go is more the food banks. And so you take excess export product, they would be in a position to try to repackage that and give it out to the food banks. Another question is, is labor capacity in warehouses itself affected? And what are the downstream impacts of that? At so least on for us, like it, it's almost it's almost it's almost fortunate in a way. Uh, the warehouses themselves are zero degrees Fahrenheit, and they're massive. And oftentimes there are shields around a forklift. And given the fact that it's zero degrees Fahrenheit, you're wearing a lot of clothing, which can can function as PPE yeah. in, in a pinch, right? So right. we we have been fortunate in that way, I think. Right. But I don't want to. I don't want to undersell the the risk of the sure. labor force here. Sure. I mean, yeah, it is yeah, a, yeah. It is a really difficult trade off. What do you do? Do you pull the rug out from under civilization, um, or do you take every every precaution that you can and um, for uh, and shut shut them down? Uh, for us, we have we have significant social distancing policies in the warehouses, which have prevented a significant disruption at our warehouses. Um, those social distancing policies have largely been able to be effective because of the physical size of the facilities. So you might be talking 2000 square feet per employee in a big facility like this, um, where it is much more difficult as an office labor. And so we've removed most, we've removed basically all of the office labor that we can from the facilities and we're having a lot of people work at home. But um, empirically, most of the labor disruptions have occurred up at the meat packing plants. And we don't operate them, so I don't think we're really well qualified to uh, comment on those dynamics. But uh, it's it's the safety of our employees is the number one priority right now. Yeah, Professor Leachman. Okay, so this makes me uh, think about the issue of robotization. Yeah, <laughs> which of course we talked about in my class. And yeah. Uh, is, you know, one of the major trends out there. And so one of the things I see as a byproduct of the whole situation we're currently in 
is that it hasn't changed the way industry is moving. Okay, mm -hmm. the trends were already there to create resiliency in the supply chain, to bring mm -hmm. functions closer to home, uh, maybe on a regional basis, that kind of thing. And of course, automization of yeah. the production process. Right. And uh, so now I see this pandemic as just accelerating that whole process times 10. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're, if that's sort of your perspective on what's going to happen. And right. make a couple of comments about that, okay? Uh, you know, robot, anything that can be routinized can be automated, okay? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And I'm not clear about the whole process in, in terms of food manufacturing, right. uh, carving meat, that kind of thing. Yeah. But it certainly seems to me like that's viable. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, once you go to automation, of course, you eliminate the overhead of things like unemployment compensation, insurance, um, uh, productivity issues due to mm -hmm. illness, liability issues, all of those sorts of things. Right. And, and uh, this creates a further advantage for mechanization over human labor. Right. And, and uh, then when you think about that human labor as being really that blue collar kind of labor, okay, mm -hmm. which has historically been the stepping stone to the middle class, okay, right. uh, it creates for me a whole host of, of tremendous worry uh, right. about labor. And right. not all labor, uh, but uh, rather low-skilled uh, right. labor, and right. uh, and I and I'm wondering, you know, if you're seeing this right. this in your supply right. chain. I know you right. deal with it yourself, right. okay, right. and you've done the math on it, and the robots win. Um, and so, could you just speak to that a bit? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, most of the labor is frankly above us or below us in the supply chain. So if you talk about farm worker employment, it vastly exceeds the refrigerated supply chain. If you talk about retail employment, it vastly exceeds the refrigerated supply chain. You're talking several orders of magnitude. Now, um, the primary robotics, if you look up to the ag supply chain or also to the uh, slaughterhouses, um, we call the primary outstanding robotic problem is something that we call the soft touch problem, which is that robots are not very good at grasping something without endangering crushing something like a berry. And mm -hmm. so I see an enormous amount of research and development dollars put towards solving that exact problem. Now, it's not implicated in our business, but if you look up in the supply chain, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge determinant. Um, down in the supply chain, retailers, I think what you see here, and if you go back to this plot, what you see here is a reordering of the objectives of the supply chain, where once upon a time, the whole purpose was to gawk at the 50 types of yogurt that were available to you in the grocery store. Now that basic availability has been questioned, we're saying, ain't nobody got time for that ship out as many calories as possible to guarantee base availability in every category. Now, the American supermarket, one of the reasons why it's so labor intensive right now is that there's 50,000 items available in your nominal supermarket. And that number is only growing. Um, and that variety is also what makes it really hard to automate right now. And so, I could see the two working together where you have a kind of strategic pullback on variety coupled with an increase in automation. But again, we're not retailers, so I can't comment on that too clearly. As far as we're concerned, the underlying economic incentives are largely the same because you can't really compute the dollar benefit from being quote unquote more resilient here. I think we are starting to change our automation strategy to go more towards stuff that would be difficult to socially distance of do automation purely for the purposes of saving of, of uh, safety, even if it's uh, economically irrational. But I think, um, I think, 
yes, in general, like it's more of a political question for me and a policy question because it's, it's okay. You can have a kind of debate in a democracy about um, economic impacts to workers and who gets what and all this. Well, now consumers have started to question basic availability of staples. Does that turn into a Lord of the Flies like situation where it's just like, okay, do everything we can to guarantee availability, automate, automate, automate. It's more of a policy and a political question to me that I can't answer, but um, the underlying incentives, this only, they're greater than or equal to zero. And I think after we're done with all of this, uh, all of this craziness that we're going through, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of thinking about it. But I do want to. I do want to go back. Question. Go ahead. If you want to just, are you near finishing up? Because I this will take us back toward the beginning. So. Okay. Perfect. Um, what I'll do is we already discussed automation, so we'll just end on the just-in-time resilience. Okay. So. Look at this. Increases primarily related to lower sales volume year on year, which resulted in cost absorption penalties from lower sale volumes as, and here's the important part, businesses work to reduce inventories and improve cash flow. That is the objective of just-in-time inventories. And this is a statement that 3M made in their annual SEC filing 10K covering 2019. It dropped in early February, okay? Here you've got 3M, the primary manufacturer in the world of personal protective equipment, talking about taking intentional steps designed to shore up their balance sheet and free up cash by reducing inventories and imp to improve cash flow. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And everyone, and, and everyone liked it too, right? I mean, they put that in their 10K to increase confidence right. in their product and how they run the company. Right, right. right. That's what your activist hedge fund wants you to do is free up cash yeah. and inventory so that they can return it to shareholders. It kind That's of brings up this, this question to me of, you know, the statistics of rare events uh, is, is difficult. And it's almost kind of clear that these rare event, the resiliency is a way to deal with these rare events and doing that expected value calculation for your supply chain. Um, it appears that a lot of companies haven't, haven't done that all the way. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we, like, I mean, I'm proud of the fact that of all of the supply chains implicated in this, whether personal protective equipment, medical devices, pharmaceutical, um, dry food, the only one that really didn't fall down was perishable food. Carrots are available. Meat is still broadly available. Um, I wish I could claim, I think on some part of it, you can claim uh, a, a moral fortitude in as much as, hey, we respect mother nature. But in reality, we've been trained. The system has trained us to not rely on the availability of this stuff. And the system has trained us and history has trained us. The history of humanity is in very large measure the history of agricultural disruptions. And so the system is dealing with things that now the rest of the economy is shocked to learn are a factor. Um, and so that's got to change everyone else's outlook on all of this. I hope it does, because the fact that the U.S. ran out of masks is really frightening. And I'm proud that we didn't run out of broccoli. But if we had to choose between a selective disruption and a food commodity and masks, I would have traded our, our better planning for the masks. So, but with that, I think we already covered robotics. so. I'll just go back to the go back to the outline. Question? Great. Yeah. So fantastic presentation, guys. You covered so much ground, and I'm glad you ended with 3M. Uh, I have a question at, that actually would link the 3M case with the uh, meat plant cases, and it mm -hmm. it it involves inventories, which you talked a lot about. But it also involves a factor you didn't mention, which was legal liabilities. So mm -hmm. in the 3M case with the N95 masks, yeah, I initially thought a lot of the problems of the shortages had to do with inventory problems and the fact that 3M had its supply chain partly in China, some in the US yeah. and in other countries, right. and there wasn't enough inventory. But when I was reading about the debate going on between Trump 
and 3M, it mm -hmm. turned out that 3M said an equally, if not bigger problem for them was the legal liability problem about the masks. Mm -hmm. And that was that there was two types of N95 masks they make. One right. is for industrial use and the other is for medical right. use. Industrial right. use is about 80% medical 20. Yeah. And their concern on the legal liability side was unless the government was able to issue the industry as a whole a waiver that mm -hmm. industrial masks that would be repurposed for medical use because of right. this emergency would not have liability. The, mm -hmm. the industry was not willing and, and 3M was not willing to repurpose those, those masks. And it took about three weeks for the Trump administration to finally mm -hmm. agree to right. give a waiver and right. it's been an industry issue for years, but right. it's, but the same thing might apply, it seems to me, to the, the current meat plant problem. So yesterday, mm -hmm. Trump announces that the meat plants have to stay open in the pandemic, even yeah. though they've got these incredible outbreaks of uh, the, the COVID uh, uh, crisis in, among their workers. So the question for you guys is, you mentioned how inventory for things like turkeys is something that can actually last a whole year round. Mm -hmm. What would happen if in the case of these meat plants, the workers say we cannot come into work because of the health problems. Is, it, is there enough inventory in the system or uh, switching between yeah. different types of meat products to allow those plants to close down? It seems like, like Trump and even some of the companies are saying, our job is to feed the population and because that's right. a higher order or equally high order priority to the health issues right we've got to open right. it. but there's obviously right. less so it seems again inventory so, and liability issues come yeah. together in both cases so as far as is there enough inventory um on the advice of counsel i invoke my fifth amendment privilege <laughs> <laughs> i mean this is a really hard one because these are our these are our customers um the whole supply chain is trying to be helpful right now. And the CEOs of these major meat packers are saying things. And um, mm -hmm. right. I, I'm, me, I'm not in a position to suicide bomb them. But um, there, is, there is a lot of inventory of certain items. So hams, yeah, like these seasonal affected things like hams, ribs, all, all of that is there. So let me jump in here, okay, and I'll say uh, something that Elliot won't. It, uh, the inventory is sufficient for months for food product, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a matter of days, it's not a matter of weeks, okay? Mm -hmm. It's months. And um, so let's start with that. And the way that this was sold <clears throat> at the federal level was mm -hmm. that the inventory was something less than one month for uh, food product, okay? Uh, secondly, I wanna make the observation that, you know, the discussion of black swan events, mm -hmm. we should all now know that there are no black swan events, okay? <laughs> that they mm -hmm. are not one-offs, that these things happen. Uh, right. The particulars of how they manifest are always surprising, mm -hmm. but, the fact that they do manifest, that there are disruptions, there are, are permutations to the process, there are yeah. weather related things you can't anticipate, uh, that's here to stay. And in fact, right. it's going to only become more prevalent as we move into the future, okay? Mm -hmm. And so every manager, every CEO should be rethinking exactly how they manage their uh, production, their inventory, their supply with that in mind. And if they aren't, they aren't good managers, okay? And then thirdly, uh, let me say that one of the things that is happening parallel to the current situation is that we have had a huge concentration in industry. And mm -hmm. in the meat packing industry, there are basically three, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are the three majors, which are Tyson, Smithfield is pork, Tyson is chicken, and- And J JBS. Yeah, uh, I don't know, is JBF beef mostly? That would it's seem- It's all right. of the above. Okay, 
So uh, what you've had in that industry is this massive concentration uh, on the production side. And that's happening across the US in all industry, okay? It's happening in the financial sector, it's happening in the retail sector, it's happening in the digital community, mm -hmm. everywhere. And everyone should be concerned about that, okay? Because mm -hmm. that tilts the balance of power to business. And uh, in addition to all the other things that are emasculating the workforce and uh, the potential to um, have oppor economic opportunity in the US, I see the concentration of power as one of the most uh, critical problems. It also leads to capture of government. And this in the food supply chain is the perfect example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the end of my soapbox. No, I look, I think um I think we're I'm not disagreeing. Um I think um I think we're limited in what we want to say at this point in time. I get that. Where our job is to help our job is to help our customers however we can, and we're trying to do just that in this emergency. Uh questions from the uh audience. There are several. Uh, I would like to say one is about how, what you have been learning uh, throughout your job and uh, food supply chain, managing super, mm -hmm. supply uh, food chain could help, um, uh, could help to uh, achieve the zero hunger uh, objective of the global agenda 2030 for sustainable development. The zero, yeah. zero what objective? Hunger. I'm not sure I understand. Hunger, Sorry. like the oh zero mm -hmm. hunger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, all of what we've covered here, covers availability. Does the food exist, and is it available? I think um, I'm not an expert on how how societies allocate entitlement, but. What I can tell you is from our perspective, no one, no one on planet Earth should be hungry. There's enough food in existence to guarantee that. Yeah. Um, as far as who has money to buy it, that's, that's a, I, I wish I had an answer to that. And I also think that, I mean, it's, it's, it's ironic and unfortunate in a way, fortunate in a way that like the timing of this was such that we were about to go into the North American and European and Asian harvest seasons. And so all of that stuff was ready to go. Um, it's winter in the Southern hemisphere right now. And so you now have questions over what does the global, what, what, what happens to agricultural supplies in the global South? I can't answer that. The only place in the Southern hemisphere where we do business is Australia and New Zealand. But um, it's definitely worth considering. Yeah, it's a big it's a big push that we have at Lineage too, as well as to is we have a big partnership with Feeding America mm -hmm. and trying to use our knowledge to help increase the efficiency of other supply chains, be it for our customers or for mm -hmm. charity and charitable organizations, is is the big push we're trying to do. Because I mean, as the question kind of implies, like we we just. We know a lot about the food supply chain just by virtue of living it. And then we want to share that out for sure. Right, right. But this though is um, the same reordering that the supply chain for the commercial supply chain has had to go through will have to happen on the NGO side as well. And we've seen that with Feeding America where they have selective shortages of certain things. Their distribution channels have completely changed. Plus you have extreme availability of stuff that's not moving like food service packages. And so they've had to go redesign all of this as well. And so it's almost turned every hunger related NGO into supply chain engineers as they try to re-engineer their own supply chains. Right. And we were pretty well equipped to do that. We have a 13 person data science team and a large organization and data available to us. But um, for, uh, for the others, it's, I think it's a harder challenge. Yeah. Sorry, Professor Leachman. Yeah, um, I, I'm sure you're aware of this, but most of the uh, international organizations are forecasting uh, major famine across the globe next year. 
And uh, are you having, are you involved in that in any way and thinking about that in any way? Does it change the way you mm -hmm. do business? And then I have a follow up right. question, which relates to that, uh, just in, re, it, with respect to the United States. Uh, I would suspect, but I want you to address it, that there mm -hmm. are real regional differences. Like when you showed that warehouse graph in California yeah. versus the East Coast, that there are some real regional differences you're seeing in terms of how the supply chain is, is, is affected. And can you address that with any specificity? Okay, so um, first, as far as international efforts, I mean, our single objective through this was to guarantee storage capacity for the system. That's our core business. And for these perishable commodities, if they don't have cold storage to go to, if they can't be, um, if they can't be consumed for one reason or another, if they don't have cold storage capacity, it's going to rot. And so um, our hope is that by guaranteeing that supply availability, uh, you'll ultimately have a glut and a lot of it will end up elsewhere. You, you talk about the history of American agriculture, U.S. wheat excesses have saved famines in Russia and all over the place. Um, but um, as far as what the federal government then proceeds to do with those supplies or whether the, uh, we get hooked up with the right NGOs, I think it's, uh, it's, more, of a, it's more of a coordination problem than anything else. Um, the supplies are there and I do think there's a huge opportunity uh, for the U.S. to perhaps uh, improve its image among the world stage by being that source of food for the world. We are Can I still the. Can mm -hmm. I just make a comment, Elliot? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, this is what Amartya Zen won a Nobel Prize for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what about famine in India? That, you right. know, famine is not an issue of not enough, it right. is an issue of distribution. Right. And, and so, this is, in my view, why what you're doing is so meaningful and interesting. Mm -hmm. so I just want to say that. Oh, appreciate that. Um, and as far as uh, regional district differences are concerned, I think that's that's going to be the topic of a, a long series of academic investigations that we we analyze after all of this is over. Um, we can see superficially huge differences in the way consumers in New Jersey acted versus the way consumers in Southern California acted. Is that cultural? Is that due to the different COVID infection rate? Um, is that due to differences in the supply chain and the underlying customers implicated? Um, it's it's a, a really tough statistical exercise. And, and I think I'd, I'd use that for a, a, as a plug for the fact that I hope it's clear that we have tremendously interesting data sets available to us. And we're, we're very, very, very hopeful of academic collaborations in the future to try to figure out exactly what drove this. Sorry. For Elliot this. and Dan, just to pick up on this uh, regional variation question, since your company does business all over the world, mm -hmm. in different parts of the world, that level of concentration that Lori was talking to that's very extreme in the right. US is much less extreme in other places, both on supply and demand side. Italy right. has much more decentralized manufacturing production. Yeah. France doesn't allow agriculture and farming mm -hmm. to be as concentrated. Are you right. seeing things or learning things from dealing, let's say, in Europe or other regions mm -hmm. of the world that right. might allow us to think differently about different options in terms of uh, yeah. concentration or, or yeah. uh, more fragmented yeah. distribution that could be useful in, right. in thinking about right. different solutions? So I would I would put that into the category of stuff we have every intention of studying once we're through this series of emergencies. Um, in general, the disruption to the to the um, to the restaurant sector has been more pronounced in uh, in in Europe. So I think culturally, especially in in certain parts of the continent in the UK, people seem to eat more at restaurants than they did in, in North America, at least more of their calories came. You talk about like English pub culture and what's the norm to live in London. Um, I also think that, um, what was I gonna say? Yeah, the, um, and so that, that drop off has been much more pronounced in Europe. And the other, the other major difference is um, if you look at culturally the size of the stores. So when, I, when we talk about panic buying, the inventory is the buffer for that panic buying. 
And just as an empirical fact, grocery stores in America are vastly larger than they are in Europe. And so you seem to like, you want to do a run on a, on a little grocery store near, near where Sarah and I live part-time in Berlin. I mean, 50 people could take out the entire grocery store in the span of an hour. There's just that, not that much inventory sitting there. And the, the culture of the big box retailers really hasn't, uh, hasn't come to Europe, but uh, mm -hmm. that, that, I mean, you could call it culturally vapid. Um, I love European culture and food culture. Um, but I, I think that that lack of inventory availability could have caused a problem for them. But on the flip side, you do have a lot more trust in governing institutions. I mean, my primary experience base because my family is with Germany and Germans on the whole did not freak out. A lot of these crazy elements of the supply chain are because people were concerned about basic availability. And then the supply chain proceeded to make a show of force, at least with regard to perishable food. And now that panic buying has stopped. But in Germany, it doesn't seem like there was a huge wave because people just trusted that they would be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a question, uh, several questions about how you, uh, machine learning. Uh, they say, um, could the speakers tell us about their experience having to retrain their machine learning models? Daniel, it's yeah. all you. Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, you know, the main, the, the main difficulty in predicting how long the food is going to stay in the warehouse is that there's, number one, hyper-seasonality with food, almost. And number two, um, appetites change. So you not only have very seasonal skew mixes and demand, but very, very large changes in appetites. Like, I don't remember quinoa being a thing 10 years ago, and now it's in almost all the warehouses, right? So you have to kind of, it's, 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 it's almost kind of like treading water a lot of the time. Of you, you hope that you retrain the model and you capture stuff from say the past two or three years and you, you retrain it frequently enough to hopefully gather or, or capture the changes in appetites as well. And so it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a trade off, really. but we do the best that we can and we have access to a lot of data and it's, um, it's mm -hmm. a fun project, truly. Yeah. But I'd also, I'd also add that when you apply these kinds of techniques in real world situations, it's absolutely critical to know what you don't know. And one of the biggest conclusions coming out of the machine learning realm for us was that this is a totally new world. And so we had people calling us and asking us as data science at the very early stages of this, what's going on? What's going on? What do we need to do? Where do we need to play stuff? How do we need to reslide? And I'm just like, no, 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 you got to brace for impact here. There's really, we don't know what the new product mix is going to be with everyone sheltered in place. And so we need time to collect that information and then figure it out going forward. But brace for impact was the phrase going around the supply chain. <laughs> Serious. I mean, it was just funny because the, the, you hear about the run on grocery stores and then Elliot and I have a conversation. It's like, well, I mean, that, that's coming for us <laughs> yeah, real soon. So it's like you can see the tidal wave coming at you and you're just standing right. there on the beach. Right. And there's, there's a delay here. There's the first to be impacted are the retail locations. Then right. the distribution centers run by the retail, uh, retail location companies that are then feeding those. And then those are the ones that are placing orders to us. And so uh, ironically, in the early right. stages of this, so we could see the news reports, we could visit grocery stores we knew what was coming our way but we had expected the retailers to order sooner than they did and had been bracing yeah. for uh, but instead what happened was they said all outbound we just need to push forward to the stores we're not going to receive product um, and they had enough in inventory to manage that for a few days and then a few days later the orders dropped but that's the, and that's the real difference. So the magnitude of this spike was not different from Christmas or Thanksgiving, but you plan for Christmas or Thanksgiving. There's no ambiguity about the calendar. Whereas we're having to suddenly pull up reserve labor, try to figure out staffing in this new normal. And we don't even know when it's going to arrive. And so that was what we meant by brace for impact. 
But one of the first things that did happen was Daniel's thesis of don't break down the pallets, ship more stuff in every movement of something. And we didn't get, there wasn't perfect adoption of that thesis. You know, the, 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 the grocery stores still want only their, you know, their, their perfect normal orders of yogurt. And it's like, well, you're, you're, you're out. I've seen, I've seen the story. You're out. Just take, take the yogurt, right? As Elliot said earlier, when basic availability is in question and I just want, you know, chicken, it doesn't have to be boneless, skinless, right? Just, you know, just give me the chicken. I'll cook it myself or something, right? And so you could yeah. kind of see this bulking up or uh, bulking up of some of these things, right? Right. Thank you. I know that uh, you're being extremely kind because we uh, took away from your main activity, <laughs> which is what you describe, yeah. which is certainly not easy uh, to, um, you know, to do. And uh, so, first of all, thank you very much for all sharing with us all um, these data charts and ex in particular your experience and your knowledge of the field. I do think that this is a very important, not only topic at this time, but it's very important for us interested in uh, international trade, uh, global mm -hmm. demand, global supply, because we can learn a lot from how to be more resilient and, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly to think about you know, shocks. Of course, there are always shocks, and in, especially in your field, you deal with shocks mainly or almost seasonally. And uh, I think there are other supply chains, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. that are not used to that. And probably there is going to be some rethinking about uh, what they will do in the future. Of course, uh, yeah, I'm sure that after all of this, uh, after all of this is over, uh, there are going to be a lot of uh, restructuring going on in, uh, in yeah. the not only supply chains in the US, but global supply chains, yeah. which will have implication with nearshoring, reshoring, and mm -hmm. etc. So, Absolutely. Uh, thank you, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you again uh, yeah. maybe in uh, six months when you have um, results of your studies uh, to Love share it. with us, because that would right. be great. Uh, and we can also uh, continue our conversation. And thank you again. Thank you to all the attendees. Thank you to Laurie mm -hmm. and Gary, to Ping. Amanda, uh, Jason, Gianluca, all those who have been involved in, in, the, in this production. And um, see you soon. Thank you. Great. Uh, bye -bye. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Thanks, awesome. Daniel. Thanks Daniel. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Thank you. you. Oh. Yeah. Thank be you. Well. Bye.